Okay, all right. Now, when it I've comes to phone. mobile phones... I've got a mobile phone. I, I have two. I've Samsung touchscreen, but it's like an LG because it's touch and you can... Okay. Everyone seems to know so much yeah, about technology yeah, these days. Blackberry is good. I I and so is Apple. Why are, they, why are they called fruit? Apple. iPhone Black 3G. Green, you get what's, a, what's a bad phone to get? Old Nokia. Bad. Sometimes yeah. too much. Look, this, is I a, have. this is a Nokia or something like that. That is bad. That is bad. These are cool. These are cool. My grandma has one of those. I got it. I was getting a new phone. Oh. And it's an iPhone, so beat that as my grandma. But yeah, yeah I think that is totally rubbish. Look, yeah. you need to get a new you phone. You need a really get good a camera. New style. You need a really How can really I be so out of date? I only got this 18 months ago. What's going on with the world? When people whip themselves up into a religious frenzy over the latest must have gadgets, I can't even see the point of. It's a shop. Come in and buy some computers. Why are they so excited? And websites are starting revolutions. Facebook and Twitter mean it won't go unseen. The world seems to have been taken over by a bunch of technology mega brands who are in everybody's pockets and living rooms, except mine. You know, I might be looking to sell it on. Yeah, I'll give you 50p. That's it. I'm going to drag myself out of the dark ages. I'm going to knock on the doors of the big boys. The rocket-powered mega brands we all know. This is where it all happens, the whole Facebook thing. I'm going to find out what's going on. Where did they come from? Nokia started off being famous for toilet paper. How do they get us to want all this stuff? What we found out about the PlayStation 3 was it cost more to build than they were selling it for. And how much money are they really making out of us? I want to know who's driving all this, and I'm going to look everywhere to find out. Does that mean that technology is the new religion? And I mean everywhere. You could say that the uh, the porn industry is the weathercock of technology. Ah! Yay! Woo! Mobile phones! Nah. Yeah. Can I stop doing it now? Please. <laughs> Feels very embarrassing. What's wrong with my phone? It's a Nokia 6330 Classic with the stainless steel effect finish on the back. It's a beautiful piece of kit. And everybody tells me that me, me new Windows netbook isn't cool either. I should be getting an Apple MacBook. I should be getting an iPad. I should be going on Facebook. How have the brands ma managed to persuade so many people that these things are cool and worth hundreds of pounds more than anything else? That's cool, guys. Look at it. Look at me. Apple this, iPad that. It's got a lovely keyboard that's very easy to use, although the shift key is in a slightly unintuitive position. Xbox 360 Connect apps. Am I missing out? What is the point of all these things? Am I on the outside? Are they having more fun than I can ever imagine? Let's find out. I'm going to start off by looking at Apple, the brand I have the most arguments about. People get so worked up about it. What is it about Apple that makes people so emotional? If Apple was a person, young, hip, trendy East London design type with, uh, with glasses similar to yours. Spoiled, kind of snobby. So I think they would wear white clothing. The sort of person who might invite you to their birthday party, but when you got there, you'd be doing everything that they wanted to. Apple seems to inspire feelings in its users which other technology brands just can't reach, especially when they're opening a new shop. These Apple store openings are absolutely bizarre. It, it's like mass hysteria, like some sort of religious cult or something. I want to see what goes on at an Apple store opening, and it seems I might be in luck. Thanks for calling Apple. Press 1. Because there are rumours all over the internet that a brand new flagship store is opening in London soon. Hi there. I'm after some information on uh, Apple store openings. I, I've heard that there might be one opening in London. But I'm told that Apple don't comment on rumours and speculation. But there are goings on in London's Covent Garden. First of all, this curtain appears. Then half an apple pokes out. What could that mean? I bumped into an Apple store opening veteran who might be able to shed some light on things. So how many shop openings have you been to? Roughly 30, I'd say. Some around the world, maybe most of them in the UK. But although he runs a successful Apple blog, he doesn't seem to know any more than I do. It's, it's a common thing with Apple and their stores. Um, they just keep this mystique about them for as, as long as they possibly can. 
um, and then maybe a week beforehand they'll give you a location and a date and a time and, and that's it. I'm wondering if all this secrecy is normal for technology brands. I think what's really clever is the way they play the press. So Microsoft, Microsoft has a folder on every journalist. They, they basically keep tabs on all the journalists and what they're interested in. How do you get journalists to write favourable things about you? Apple doesn't do that at all. Apple won't even talk to us. And so there's this incredible air of mystery around them. Uh, and everyone's trying to work out what's going on. There are all these rumour sites, you know, and it, it's brilliant marketing um, because you just write anything about, about Apple and everyone wants to know what it is. At last, Apple announced that there will be a store opening here, but don't confirm the date until five days before. No cheap rate advance tickets for Apple fanatics. It's uh, five to six on Friday evening. It opens at ten o'clock tomorrow morning, but already there's some people sitting on the floor over there uh, waiting to be the first in the queue for when it opens. I come from Turkey. Turkey? Yeah. From Russia. I have missed uh, two times in China, so I don't want to miss this one. I flew from California to stand out here all night and uh, see just, what the store so looks like. So you came all the way here just to queue up to go into a shop? Yes. I've been here since about 10 o'clock this morning. So that, that's about 24 hours before the shop actually opens? Yeah, yeah. So why was it important to you to get here so early? Normally when you see the first person in line, it's normally a guy. And so I kind of wanted to be one of the first girls who's first in line. <laughs> Do you work here then or what? I do, yes. I have the pleasure of working here. So what, what's going to happen at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning then? Uh, an immense amount of pandemonium and energy. It's going to yeah. be amazing. Is it like, you know, grand opening? I was just chatting to him, asking him what's going to happen tomorrow when somebody came up to him, took him to one side, whispered in his ear and then he disappeared completely. So uh, I'm thinking they want to keep everything on message, they're, they're, they're very suspicious of anybody asking questions. Maybe these are the enforcers of the, of the party line. It's Saturday morning now and the shop opens in a little over an hour. Uh, the queue has got absolutely gigantic. It's now snaking out in front of the shop and it goes over there past the, the walkway and round the corner of the courtyard. Uh, you can hear a lot of noise coming now from inside the shop. It's basically all the members of staff are being whipped up into some sort of crazy evangelical frenzy, uh, clapping and cheering and jumping up and down. As I'm not allowed to go in and see what's going on, I think I'll have a go myself. iPhones and iPads and stuff and 3Gs and that. Then the staff come out and make me look like an amateur. They've all got sort of like glassy eyes, like as if they've been sort of whipped into a state of hysteria and they're, they're at some kind of prayer meeting where somebody's going to get healed or something. Finally, they're ready to open the doors. Unfortunately, my friend who's first in the queue is a little overexcited and runs in before the countdown. Undeterred, the Apple preachers count down anyway. Honestly, say I've never seen anything like this at PC World. Time to be initiated. What's going on here? Sure, Apple make computers, phones and MP3 players that people really like, but this devotion to the brand, it goes beyond anything I've ever seen. These people need their heads examining. They really do. Wouldn't that be great if you could take an Apple fan? Let's say Alex, for example. He's got a lot of Apple stuff. 
You could say he's obsessed. Definitely 24 hours a day thinking about Apple. You could put him in a head examining machine, which would look inside his brain while he was thinking of Apple and see what's going on. Well, guess what? I've found a group of brain scientists who can do exactly that, and Alex has agreed to provide his head. This fancy bit of kit is an MRI scanner. Basically, there's a massive electromagnet in there, and if I was holding some metal things, it would fly to the air and smash someone's face off. That's why I can only come this far. I like to take my ring off, my watch off, my belt off. When Alex has feelings, his brain gives off tiny electrical impulses. The scanner will be able to measure any electrical impulses stimulated by the pictures we're going to show him. Pictures of Apple gizmos, pictures of non-Apple gizmos, so we can compare the difference. You know when you're doing these experiments and that, is there ever a moment where you sort of go, ooh, it's a brain, it's horrible? The Neurosense group have analysed hundreds of people's responses to all kinds of different things. Hopefully, they can give me a clue as to what kind of feelings Alex is having. So is Alex quite a fan of Apple, then? Yes, he is, definitely. Well, it's kind of interesting, because we see quite a quite amount of changes in the brain when he's actually looking at Apple products, which are quite fascinating. Let me show you something here. So there's much more activity in the visual cortex, an enhanced sort of visual attention, if you like, to the Apple products. So, so what, he, what he's looking more intently at, the, at that, he's like his eyes are sort of drinking it all in. Well, that's right. We often see this when people are very loyal to a brand. Not much surprise so far, but Neurosense have done this kind of comparison on different groups of people. One group was very religious. When we've also then looked at a different group of subjects looking at religious versus non-religious images, we can see a very similar pattern of activity. Well, it's interesting that when we went down to the opening of the Apple store in Covent Garden and it was almost like a religious meeting, it was like an evangelical thing with people whooped up into, a, into almost a, a sort of a hysteria. Well, we think one, of the, one way to interpret this data is to suggest that these big technology brands have harnessed or exploit the brain areas that have evolved to process religion. So the brain scan shows that the Apple products are triggering the same bits of Alex's brain as religious imagery triggers in a person of faith. And I'm not the first to see a parallel. But the thing is, if you think that tablet... What, uh, what's, what's, what you got there, the... Oh, yeah, no, this is the Economist. This is a cover article I did earlier in the year. The Book of Jobs. About, yes, the Book of the, 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 Holy, um, the Holy iPad was announced that week. And um, so this was our take on it. How does a brand become a religion? The Bishop of Buckingham reads his Bible on an iPad. Um, this is a standard Hebrew text of the Book of Judges. He's offered to tell me how Apple has been sanctified. I think there are various ways that a, a religion, if you like, works um, in human terms. You need a story, don't you? Appleism, Chapter 1, The Story. In 1976, Steve Jobs and two other California geeks started a computer company for enthusiasts in their garage. They called it Apple. It was boom time for personal computers, and within six years, they were multi-millionaires. Huge multinational corporation like Apple could not be further from two kids building a thing in a garage. But you need a strand of the DNA that feels like that to people. Appleism Chapter 2 the Antichrist. Apple's main competition was the giant corporation IBM, who teamed up with Bill Gates' Microsoft to make computers into boring business machines. Meanwhile, Apple invented things like icons and mice to liberate us. We shall prevail. As they showed us in this legendary advert. You'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. In the Bible, you have these great stories of dragons and, you know, 13-headed beasts and things. Um, with Apple, you've got IBM, haven't you, and the great sort of apocalyptic battle against the sort of anti-figure. Sort of Appleism, Chapter 3, 
the place of worship. Even I noticed that the Apple stores look like churches with their stone floors and arches and little altars. They are um, extraordinary uh, temples. I'm always, I, I go up the, uh, the glass staircase, which has this extraordinary different texture of light coming through it. Appleism, Chapter 4, The Messiah. In 1985, an evil traitor within Apple fired Steve Jobs from his own company. Without him, they were lost. Within a few years, they were in dire straits. It's sitting on $2 billion worth of unsold computers. So they repented and begged Steve to return. He then created the iMac, the first of a series of hit products which propelled Apple back to the top, overtaking Microsoft in value last year. I think that everything that Steve Jobs has ever done has been for the benefit of everyone. The new wide iPod. And yes, it does videos. When Steve Jobs talks, people listen to him because he's telling us this is what you're really going to want to do. Christianity, you have to wait for the second coming. You know, with Apple, it happened in 1997 or whatever. <laughs> What's going on? Hello. <laughs> this is an iPhone 4. I haven't bought it myself. Uh, it's very expensive. I've borrowed it. I want to see if any of these things are, are worth the, the money. Um, there you go. That's it. It's, uh, it's quite nice, quite glossy. And, uh, you know, Apple seem to be very, very clever at marketing, very, very clever at design. And by, by combining these things, they've managed to sort of tap into a part of our brain which um, creates this kind of religious style hysteria. But there are other mega brands we all still use. My netbook has got Microsoft Windows on it. How come Microsoft are so big? They don't have to rely on, on making people believe that it's some sort of like religious experience buying one of their computers. Uh, so what are their secrets? If Microsoft were a person, they'd be old. They would work at Tesco. Constantly making mistakes, maybe tripping up a lot. I can see them coming with one look this week and then another look next week. Someone who has been divorced recently, someone who was kind of settled and dull and in their nook, and then they've been thrust out into the world and have to try and pretend to be young again. 93% of the world's computers run on Microsoft Windows software, and last year they made a video to launch the latest version, which has now reached cult status. Welcome to the party. The four of us, along with Host Worldwide and you, are launching Windows 7 Ultimate Software. So, you know what? Let's take a minute or so to tell you about how great it is to host a launch party. You can use house party tools to build your guest list, upload your pictures, which is his favorite, right? <laughs> and you can even get a party pack. Apparently, so one commentator said that if Microsoft were in charge of PR for sex, the human race would be extinct. I showed my guests things from two of the Windows 7 or orientation videos and it took like 10 minutes right. oh you know it was great it was totally informal like everyone just kind of crowded around the computer in the kitchen this is even more bizarre than the apple store opening what were they thinking this really is our launch yeah you're right so it ought to be a party mm -hmm. have fun out there <laughs> cheers, cheers have a good one guys oh my gosh i'm so hungry let's eat how come a company this uncool could be on all of our computers and making so much money in stark contrast to Apple, Microsoft have agreed to talk to me. So I'm heading across the pond to their headquarters outside Seattle. This is what I know so far. When businesses started using computers in the early 80s, they turned to the massive corporate IBM to supply them. IBM could make the computers, but they didn't understand this newfangled software stuff. So they turned to a bunch of college dropout super geeks called Microsoft, the world's first software company, headed by little Bill Gates. Unfortunately, being a bit new to all this, IBM let Microsoft keep most of the rights to the software they'd written. No. With hindsight, you wonder, why would IBM, that huge, great corporation, $50 billion corporation, why would they strike such a stupid deal with this kid? And they did. And they went, oops, what have we done now? Bill Gates will never sneak up on anybody again like that. Keeping the rights meant that as PCs took over the world, Bill Gates became the richest man in the world. Can you hear that noise? It's 
sound of computers. Massive, gigantic computers, processing things, coming up with ideas, developing new products, doing PowerPoint presentations. My tour of the 350-acre headquarters begins immediately, and they're very keen to show me everything. I've already found out where a chunk of that massive profit goes. Microsoft spends five and a half billion pounds every year on research and development. This is the front yard of the future, and behind these doors is the home of the future. Someone is at the front door. Hello. Hello. Are you a robot? I am not a robot, okay. guaranteed. And the way In the future, fingerprints open doors. Eventually. In the future, statues of the Eiffel Tower automatically bring up photos of Paris. In the future, you can pause documentaries like this one to buy things. This is a Contoso backpack. And so imagine an avatar, advertiser might be able to uh, uh, plug their, um, their gear in here. This room to become... In the future, space. wallpaper and so moves. If I walk in and I point to uh, the wall here, we will bring up a menu of different... Um, <laughs> ah, they've got a few years to get it working. Grace, it is the menu. future, after all. Well worth £5 billion, if you ask me. OK, let's move on. There's a hint of desperation here, and I think I might know why. Microsoft grew so big because of the stranglehold they had on any software for the PC. But since the 90s, they've been prosecuted three times for running an illegal monopoly. One of the things that happened in, in the Microsoft trial, which really didn't help them, was, was the, uh, the video testimony given by Bill Gates. And, um, you know, he really ought to have had a bit of media coaching there, I think. Would you agree that Microsoft is the world's most respected computer software company? Some people would agree with that, some people wouldn't. What's your opinion? I think we are the most, if you took, took it on a statistical basis, yes, we'd be the most respected software company. I must say that I think your answers are, are non-responsive and rambling. And that sort of uh, dealt a very uh, severe blow to the to the sort of we are the geeks, we are the cleverest culture that, that the company had. Um, and since then it has tried to reinvent itself in various ways. Ten years later, Bill Gates has retired from Microsoft to become the world's biggest charity donor. And as more and more of us are doing our computing online, the days of running Windows on PCs could be numbered. So Microsoft are using their dwindling but still massive income to try and invent other things we're all going to want. But it's not been going well. In the smartphone wars, Microsoft has been left trailing in recent years. So imagine my surprise when I found an excited queue for a Microsoft product. This is a queue of Microsoft employees going into the staff shop. They've had an email to say that a new batch have come in. They've all come from their offices and started queuing. How long have you been queuing for? Uh, about an hour. An hour? The person responsible for this gadget is in the building. Time to meet with Microsoft's cool alter ego, the hopeful saviour of their nerdy Hello. image. Hello. You're, you're Alex. I am Alex. Oh, you're I Alex. Alex as well, yes. I love Hello. your name. Yeah, it's good. We're going to be good friends. OK. Yeah. This is the new Xbox hands-free controller, Kinect. Couldn't we have one where it was a bloke doing it, rather than it? Mm. They've shifted 8 million units in the first two months since launch. This isn't House of the Future, this is House of Now, and it works pretty well. Here it comes, here it comes. If you're jumping up and down in your living room to control your Xbox, it's a small army of people like Alex who you have to thank. He actually started programming at the age of five. I did. That's weird. Are you, uh, you know, abused by your parents? No. Is this something that they made you do, they forced you to do it, and it was your only refuge? Nope, it's the only thing I, 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 I would run away and do it. Anything they would want me really? outside playing sports. What's, what is your actual job at Microsoft? My job um, is to uh, um, invent the future. While everybody else is putting gadgets and gizmos in people's hands, my objective is to make technology disappear. It's to create simpler ways 
for people to be able to interact with this art form that, I, that I'm so in love with um, of interactive entertainment. And it seems to be working and because Connect is now the fastest selling electronic device of all time. As I head back to the UK, I wonder how Xbox users feel about their cool games console being made by the uncool monopolising giant. Now, you're all familiar with Xbox, but do you know who makes the Xbox? Mm. Uh, Anybody know what it is? is it Anybody? Mr Xbox? <laughs> Mr Freddy Xbox, yes, that's his name. Seriously? <laughs> no. I found a lot of people don't really associate Microsoft with Xbox. When I look for their logo on the box, I can see why. There's a very small one there. You'd need quite good eyesight to see that. On the back, there's another small logo for the same Microsoft. So here's a mega company living off past glory, desperately trying to reinvent themselves, but they've become so uncool, they don't even dare put their name on their own products. Whatever next. Now, a games console is a bit of technology I can relate to, and it's big business. There are over 40 million PlayStation 3s, over 50 million Xbox 360s, and over 80 million Wiis. So, I've assembled a crack team to help me decide what the big questions are. Did I just get killed? Vincent is something of a kindred spirit, as he's almost as stingy as I am. He's just got a very good deal on a second-hand games console. So, why, why did you buy it second-hand? Because I wasn't in a buying brand new at all. I'm not spending that sort of money on a computer console. We keep coming back to the subject of price. So how much peas do they make a year then? Like, how much peas? Yeah, like Profits? How much, yeah. Like how much? Like, well, I don't know. That's, so that's, like, that's a very good question. <laughs> how much do you think it costs to make a, yeah, a, a PlayStation 3? Like 70, 70 pounds? Yeah. I don't think it costs more than 100 pounds. So how much profit are they making? The PlayStation 3 is the most expensive console. It's at least £240. How much is Sony getting? If Sony were a person, I think it would be kind of middle class. They're the same as a hundred other anonymous bank workers. They'd have a BMW. A reliable elder statesman. When Sony started life just after the Second World War in Tokyo, their first product was an electric rice cooker. But they made their name with tape recorders and transistor radios. By the beginning of the 21st century, they were making all kinds of consumer and professional electronics, as well as owning Columbia Studios and Sony Records. PlayStation was first introduced in 1994. Not surprisingly, I can't get them to tell me how much it costs to make, but I found someone who will. I'm really sorry about this but you're gonna die. So with a plan in my head and a kamikaze PS3 in my hand, I'm clocking up the air miles again. I'm in Los Angeles, California, IA, uh, and I'm just about to go and meet a chap who, uh, for a living, takes apart pieces of technology to their components and works out how much they cost to make. Let's have a look at the PlayStation. It was hard to see her lying there on the operating table, but it would be a worthy end. Okay, start. My PlayStation has been completely stripped to its fundamentals so that every chip, plate, diode, fan or screw can be added up and complete manufacturing costs calculated. Well, that's ruined. I mean, look at the state of it. This is ruined. So what, what did you find out about it? Well, what we found out about the PlayStation 3 was, in fact, that uh, it cost more to build than they were selling it for. That wasn't what I was expecting to hear. One would expect that if you're building something, you're going to sell it for more than you build. A profit, in effect. <laughs> exactly. And by the way, we looked at it several times because we were in disbelief. We thought, this surely is not possible. Let's go back, let's sharpen our pencils, let's make sure we've done our, our, our research correctly, our, our calculations correctly. And sure enough, you know, here was one where there was a significant number of dollars that they were basically wrapping around each PlayStation and shipping it out the door with it. Woohoo! There's over 4,000 individual bits and I supply have worked out the cost of every single piece. They estimate that the cost of all these pieces put together is 
$805. Now, when this was sold in the shops when it first came out in 2006, the, the price was $499. Now, s since it was launched, they've been trying to, to make it cheaper to make, but they're still losing $37 on each machine. Now, they've sold 41 million PlayStation 3s, and if you work out all the losses they've made, it comes up at $3 billion losses on 41 million consoles. How on earth can they make that pay? This Blu-ray drive alone accounted for $107 of cost. And actually, you don't need a Blu-ray player to uh, play games. Blu-ray is just the high-definition version of DVD. It shouldn't make much difference to gaming, except add a chunk of change to the price. So what's it doing in a PS3? More research connected the PS3 to an old story about Sony, a bloody battle which left them bruised and humiliated. The real video war isn't fought against invaders from outer space, it's battled out on the high streets of Britain. At stake, a multi-million pound industry. The weapons? Well, it's all a matter of format. Once upon a time, when home video was new, there were two totally incompatible formats. Betamax from Sony and VHS from JVC. Video rental shops were a nightmare. One side of the shop for each rival format. Two copies of each movie. During the 1980s, the format war raged, but two things happened. JVC let other people make VHS machines, making it cheaper, and they found a very lucrative market which Sony wouldn't allow onto Betamax. Porn. Home video had created an explosion in the pants of the adult video market. Suddenly, you could watch filth in the privacy of your own home. By the 90s, it was all over for Sony's Betamax. Flash forward 16 years, and we've all got to get new high-def DVD players. Whoopee! But hang on, it's happened again. There's two totally incompatible formats. Blu-ray from Sony and HD DVD from Toshiba. This time Sony aren't taking any chances, so they smuggle a Blu-ray player into our living rooms, at great expense to themselves, inside every PlayStation 3. That's a start, but just how many compromises are Sony willing to make? This is Los Angeles, California, IA. Should be beautiful hot sunshine, we should be all be in bikinis and trunks. And look at it. But luckily, we're filming the next bit uh, indoors. I'm going to ask the real experts at a porn shoot. Digital Playground have been spearheading technology in smut since 1993. Their biggest indecent offering had a budget of £7 million. Pounds. Faithful crew of the Sea Stallion, I'm about to lead you on a perilous journey. We're going to hunt down and kill the most notorious and dangerous of all pirates. They should be able to tell me if Sony have stuck to their principles or if they've finally cuddled up to the porn industry. Lick it. <gasps> hello. Hi, hello. Oh, you must be Samantha. I am. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Pleasure nice to meet you. Meet you. What, what are we shooting today, then? We're shooting a, our first really girl-girl uh, line that we're just starting with a new director. So okay. we're very, very excited about it. I've just found out that I've got something important in common with the star of tonight's action. The infamous Hello. superstar. This Hi. is Riley Steele. Hello, Riley. My second name's Riley. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not here to make small talk. I'm a professional. There are questions to be asked. Just how important do you think the the adult industry latching onto something? It, sorry, I'm. It's okay. So how important to the sex? <laughs> the sex. You see, I'm sort <laughs> Did of. Did you get sex off the brain? Stop oh, it. Where do you think you're that's at? Just, just, uh, that's why. That's why I can't concentrate because I know what's going on behind me and I can't even. You're losing focus. This I is am. making you nervous. Let me see your okay. palms. Are you sweat? Oh, jeez. Oh, what the hell? I'll just let her talk. Right. Because <laughs> Sony would not allow adult content to be put on Blu-ray. So we were forced to go to HD for a very short period. I think just right, a few so months. So originally you, you were on HD DVD. Absolutely. In this battle between Blu-ray and HD Huge DVD. Battle. First of all, your company went on to HD DVD mm -hmm. because Sony wouldn't let we porn wouldn't, go on to Exactly, we couldn't get a license. We, have to, we had to get permission from Sony and they denied us. And then as all the other adult studios started following suit, 
doing HD. Sony came around just a few months later and said, you have our blessing, and we really? jumped on it. It's all about content. Whether it's porn content, whether it's uh, you know content from let's say Universal Studios, if you don't have them on board, it doesn't matter what your format is. It doesn't matter if it's technically superior. If there's no content, there's nothing to watch on it because you don't have an agreement with the studios. Then, you know, you're not going to win that war. They realize the, the the mass markets that we're they're going to miss out in, and how much money that could be made by giving us the license and being paid because you know adult. DVD is huge, you know, you know, over 11, what did they say, 11 billion dollar industry. You know, if, if you're so pivotal to, to the, the success, mm -hmm. do, they, do the, uh, the manufacturers court you? Do they, do they come and speak to you and ask you to, you know, adopt Absolutely. their format? Absolutely. You know, I can't, um, we've worked, you know, kind of undercover with some computer companies that I really cannot tell, <laughs> state their names, but they'll do a lot of beta testing with our products. But without, but without being public without about it, public totally knowledge. under the radar. Yes, absolutely. So Sony, determined not to lose another format war, have dropped their principles on the one hand to embrace pornography, and on the other, they've used the PlayStation like a Trojan horse to get a Blu-ray player into 41 million houses. It might have cost them $3 billion to do, about £2 billion, but that's the kind of money you have to be prepared to gamble in the technology game. And it really is a gamble. Now they've won this war, lots of other people are making Blu-ray hardware, but they still have to pay Sony. One cent on every blank disc sold, nine dollars for each Blu-ray player sold, twelve dollars for each recorder, plus a cut of all games and movies sold. But as we start downloading stuff like movies more and more and using DVDs less, no one knows if they'll get their money back before Blu-ray's obsolete. So now I know how much money they're making out of these things. Um, it's, it's amazing, isn't it, to think about the, uh, they're actually giving something away for free that you probably wouldn't have normally bought. So it just makes you think, what is hiding in the other pieces of technology that I own. It's time to find out about my phone. Three things I wouldn't leave the house without are my phone, my wallet and some shoes on my feet. The three things I take with me when I leave my house are my phone. Um, definitely my mobile. My phone. Mobile phone. 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 Mobile phone. Definitely. I'm excited to be looking into mobile phones. I think it's the most important piece of technology for virtually all of us. The numbers of mobile phones sold are staggering. Nokia is the biggest. They sell well over a million phones a day. So imagine my surprise when I read this in the newspaper. Nokia boss warns staff they're standing on burning platform. I've just found out that Nokia, the number one phone brand in the world, are in serious difficulties. And so I feel that as a user of the very good 6330 Classic, I owe it to my phone and to myself and to other people like me to get to the bottom of the problems. Nokia was a person, probably quite old, like 90 or something. You know? Just doesn't have the best of stuff. It used to be cool when I was 14. So I guess it's kind of like M &M. Back in 1865, Nokia weren't making mobile phones. They started life making rubber shoes and toilet paper. By the late 60s, they diversified from bog roll into electrics. Why not? And then this little thing came along. The new system goes under the rather prosaic name of cellular radio. What it provides is this, a phone you can take anywhere. One study suggests that between three and four million of us in Britain will have these phones by the end of the century. But it wasn't three or four million, it was 30 million and rocketing. No one saw how fast it would grow. The networks thought maybe one in 12 of us might like to have a mobile eventually. Which of the following describes how interested you would be in the idea of having this new personal telephone? Quite interesting, quite anticipated. But someone thought they could do better. So they started churning out phones for every type of person. 5110, which was the first phone with user exchangeable covers. 7650, which was our first camera phone. 5140, which is an example of the robust phone. 5110, As the number of mobile phones exploded around the world, Nokia held the number one spot. 
So how can a company which sells over a million phones a day be in trouble? I'm heading for Nokia's biggest factory to see what I can learn. This is an example of just how fast the pace of change is. We're about 10 minutes away from the biggest mobile phone factory in India, the second biggest mobile phone factory in the entire world, and this is just, you couldn't be more rural, could you? I'm amazed we've got in actually. The, the security is incredible. They check the serial numbers of all our mobile phones to make sure that we don't swap them for a new one while we're walking around. The plant goes for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there's three shifts with over 2,000 people on a shift. Since 2006, they've produced 400 million, 400 million mobile phones. We can only afford to be here. We can't fund the next process, whatever it might be. I didn't get any clues as to why Nokia are in trouble until after I left the factory. My inquiries lead me to Delhi Central Market, where I find an imposter. So th this one, this one looks like mine. This is obviously a Nokia-style one. Yep. Um, that is a copy of your phone, exact copy. Well, I, actually, it's, it's a, a better model. It's the higher model than mine. It's, it's a better model. <laughs> I can't believe right. it. These are Shanzai or Bandit phones made in small factories in China. These are look-alike copies which can be churned out so quickly that sometimes they're in the shops before the real thing is even released. Let's see what the features are. It takes two SIM cards. Does yours take two SIM no. cards? Do you have an MP4 player? No. Does it have it might be plastic, have no warranty, be prone to the battery exploding, but it's got more features than mine and it's a quarter of the price. And so what kind of a Nokia could you get for 1800 rupees? You wouldn't get one. Really? Yeah, yeah. But all the brands are here. What would you have? The official BlackBerry or five BlackBerry style phones for the same price? So why is Nokia the one in such trouble? I remembered what a ten-year-old girl had once told me. My grandma has you one of those. Please, please, please. I used I to get a new phone, oh. and it's an iPhone, oh. and it's an iPhone. Beat that, it's my grandma, it's an iPhone. The cause of Nokia's problems is right under my nose. And ever since the iPhone came out in 2007, that really revolutionised uh, kind of the way we look at, at phones. The iPhone isn't necessarily the best phone ever, but what it is, is a computer in your pocket. Now you're not just connected to people, you're connected to everything, including loads of apps. If you want to check snow conditions on the mountain... In fact, the iPhone ad didn't even mention making phone calls. It went big on telling us all about the apps. There's an app for that. What really made the iPhone a big success wasn't just that the hardware was very elegant and easy yeah. to use. It was this app store which had come along and revolutionized the way you looked at a cell phone. Because now you had this ability for one, two, three dollars or free to run uh, games, uh, uh, any number of things. All these apps are brilliant fun for the user and an absolute cash cow for Apple. Because every time you buy an app, Apple takes 30%. Plus, they get money from any advertising on the apps. The iPhone, it's the gift that keeps giving. To Apple, that is. It's no longer about spending $300 on the equipment once and then it's done. So that's why Nokia are in trouble. They've been left behind in the smartphone revolution. But I've still got some unanswered questions. This is the most popular app on the iPhone, Facebook, yet it's free and there isn't even any advertising on it. So if they're giving it away for nothing, how come the brand is worth £30 billion? What's their secret? I've been avoiding this for years. Oh well. As you know, I think Facebook is a waste of time. Uh, it's just a stupid thing for people who've got, you know, nothing better to do. However, I know you're on it, <laughs> and so I would like to set up my own page just to see what it's like. What is it? Facebook.com, wasn't it? Yeah, it should come up. Oh, it's one of your favourites. It's actually gone onto my profile. Oh. So. Currently hates DHL more than anything in the world. It's like Facebook is a person. Annoying. They'll probably be getting bought the drinks. It's someone that you're, everyone you know knows, so you have to associate with them, but really left to yourself, you would probably not hang out with them. Secondary school university employer. <laughs> What's all this? This is, this is really, you know, why do they need to know about that? So you can find your friends. Philosophy. Religion. Religion. Uh, 
you see the idea of, of, of putting all this personal information in? It, it just makes me feel really nervous. Um, As I'm uploading my profile, I can see little ads on the right-hand side. Surely they're not enough to bring in this vast amount of dosh. No, it shouldn't be. Oh, on, There's only one thing for it. I'm going to have to hit the road and go and ask them how come they're so rich. Here's what I know so far. In 2003, Mark Zuckerberg was a student at Harvard University. One drunken evening, he created an application called FaceMash by hacking into the university database. Originally, he wanted to compare students' ID photos to farm animals. Other students could vote on who was hotter. He soon dropped the animals and compared one student to another. Although humiliating and elitist, it was a smash hit. So, after fighting off various lawsuits brought against him for security breaches and plagiarism, Zuckerberg released Facebook. Four years later, he became the world's youngest self-made billionaire. In some ways, this has been the Facebook revolution. These days, Facebook is connecting 600 million people around the world and rising. Just travelling south out of San Francisco at the moment. So this is it, Facebook headquarters. Looks a bit like some sort of um, college campus somewhere in the leafy boondocks. I'm meeting Chris Cox, Zuckerberg's right-hand man. He's been out of nappies for over a week now. So this is uh, the entrance to Facebook. This is our headquarters. People walk in and then our visitors um, can write on the wall, which is a throwback to the original wall on the profile where you could just write whatever you want. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Al Gore. Al Gore. Kanye West was here. People want to come see what's going on in here, you know. I'm actually really close to the richest person I've never met. The meeting room there is actually Mark Zuckerberg. I wasn't allowed to actually talk to him, but I could gaze through the window. Man of the Year 2010, Mark Zuckerberg. Just it's as simple as that, look at that. What, what would you say is the secret of the success of Facebook? I think the secret is that the product we're building is about people. I mean, it's connectedness. So it's creating a company, a product, a brand that, that keys into a sort of human need. Yeah. So how, do, how does Facebook make money? What we've created is a really simple way to, for marketers to put stuff in front of people according to some really basic information like where they live and what they've listed that they care about. So Facebook can sort through all that personal information I typed in to deliver me to just the right person who wants to flog me something. That's why it's worth so much money. Because if you advertise in a magazine and you want to reach classic car fans who are into Arctic monkeys, it's a pretty hit and miss business. But on Facebook, bingo! So if that's how it works online, how come there's no advertising on Facebook's iPhone app? At the moment there's no advertising on there. What's, what's going on there? It's not about making money. We're trying to build this platform where everybody can share stuff with people. So Eventually. Surely. It'll be too tempting. Someday. Millions and tens and hundreds of millions of new <laughs> customers on their phones all the time in India and China and Africa and South America. Come on, you, people, people are going to be beating the path to your door saying, come on, we want to do a massive advertising campaign in India. Can we use your platform? You're going to say yes. I think that one day there will probably be some advertising experience on the mobile phone, but, you know, at the end of the day, that's not what most people are asking for right now. I guess that nothing's really free in this weird world of technology brands. You get the software, but they get your details to target ads at you. It's the new way of making gazillions, and these guys are the new gazillionaires. I mean, in a way, they are like rock stars, aren't they? Because they're young, they've got pots of money, they're sort of doing something that people around the world are completely fascinated by. The next morning, I've had a thought. There's another young company just half an hour down the road from here. They invented the idea of making money by doing stuff for me for free. But they don't ask me for any personal information. And yet they make 20 times the amount of money from advertising that Facebook do. Young, like 20. He would own a Ferrari. Someone cool and trustworthy and generally nice to you, but with the vague sense that they might be, you know, stealing your money. 
<laughs> you've got to search him to Google. Is it just basically a load of people with like encyclopedias and stuff and, and telephone directories and they just like go through and find numbers and, and websites and then type them back very, very quickly? Yeah, probably not. This is what I know about Google so far. In the mid-90s, young eggheads Larry Page and Sergey Brin met at Stanford University. This was still the early days of the internet. There were only around 40 million people online worldwide. There were already a couple of search sites, but they were reading and hand-indexing everything on the internet. Larry and Sergey developed a way for the computer to automatically search and organize the information. If you printed out the information, it'd be over 70 miles high. And we can search that for you in half a second and give you, you know, back exactly what you wanted. The only problem was they hadn't figured out how to make any money out of it. We were always confident that we would find a way to make money, even though we didn't know exactly what it was. In 12 years, Google has become the most visited website on Earth. Their mission statement is to organize all the world's information and make it accessible to everyone. They're quite keen to organize me as well. This is one of the, uh, really, hang on. But I am allowed to be filmed riding one of the Google bikes through the Google umbrellas. And I'm allowed to see all the sculptures and volleyball courts. I'm due to interview Google's first lady, Marissa Meyer, one of Fortune's 50 most powerful women in the world. I want to ask how they can make such vast sums. But 10 minutes before the interview, she drops out due to illness. None of the other 20,000 employees of Google are available to give me any juicy secrets. So the PR guy volunteers himself. Are you a Googler? I am a Googler, yes. And new people are Nooglers. New, new people are? Are Nooglers. Nooglers. With an M. What about if you've left the company? Then you're Exoogler. But I don't really think this is the secret of Google's wealth. So I'm heading home. I use Google's Chrome browser to Google the airport, print out a map from Google Maps, and then I Google Google UK. I check out the managing director on Google's YouTube, write some notes about him on Google Docs. I could Gmail him from an Android phone if I had one to ask for an interview, but I haven't. So I use the Nokia to call, and all the time I'm thinking, Google are everywhere. If we're not really outside, we're inside. That's just how crazy they are, these Googleists. So at last, I can ask how oh, Google have earned so much more than Facebook without asking for any personal info. So when you search for something on Google, you'll sometimes see on some of the results pages ads. Yeah. And we make money when um, advertisers uh, get clicked on uh, when they're advertising to a, to a user. The amounts that, that they pay for each click through are what kind of amounts are we talking? Uh, it's usually pennies, but we have billions of searches across the world every day. So those, um, those uh, pennies uh, mount up over time as we reach lots of businesses. 